Good morning and welcome. Uh, today, we're going to talk about determining the, the your business value in 2021. Um, for someone like me that, uh, that spends a lot of time evaluating value, it is uh, certainly an interesting time to, to help business owners. So, so I hope today in today's presentation that we can um, provide some clarity on how you should look at your business in the event that this is the year you want to consider selling. So let's go ahead and get, get started here. So first, my name's uh, Ed Meisigland. I'm a certified business appraiser. I'm certified in, in value building uh, as well as exit planning and uh, equipment appraisal. And so, so like I was saying earlier, I spent a lot of time evaluating the merits of a business. So our, our intent as a practice is we want our clients to be educated in how people are going to look at their particular business um, from a value standpoint, because in any successful sale, it, it, it boils down to really two, two components. One is the value and two is the motivation. Um, you have those two ingredients together and you, chances are you're going to have a successful sale. Now, for those of you that may have to jump off early, we, um, um, you'll get a recording of the video as well as a, uh, our slide deck. And if you have any questions and we, we received a number of them, um, through, through, um, uh, you know, through our marketing, we, we received, uh, like I said, a, a number of questions that I have already pre-built into the presentation, but uh, if you have other questions or things that need to clarify, certainly put it in the chat box over to the right. Okay, so on today's agenda, we're going to talk about uh, the purpose of the valuation, uh, who the buyers are, uh, the approaches to value, how to maximize it, and then we'll get into some, some Q&A. So in our world, and when I say our world, I'm talking about the sale of a business world. So we're looking at at what is the value of the of the composition of the assets that are going to be sold. So we I always say it's to aid in the sale of the assets of an ongoing business, including but not limited to the furniture, fixtures, and equipment, normal inventory, trademarks, trade names, tangible and intangible, and it excludes cash accounts, receivable, and debt. That's what a typical asset sale uh, is comprised of. And that's a that's how we approach it. And the reason I share that, it differs depending on who you're talking to. Um, and, and again, that's, that's how we look at it. But in deals, you know, everything's on the table and everything is negotiable. So while I'm saying this is what's typically included, um, it, may, it may not. But for our purposes and from a, from a clarity standpoint, this is what a typical asset looks like, a asset sale looks like. So let's talk about fair market value. Now, everybody hears about that because that's what's used in, you know, regardless of the asset that you're, you're, you're talking about, whether you're talking uh, a business, uh, a car, uh, real estate, fair market value, the, the definition is roughly the same. So what I want to do is, is explain that there's, there's differences in this, in my world versus versus the hypothetical world of fair market value. So for us, you know, um, we have to do the deal in fair market value. You know, when we're talking about price and changing hands, uh, it's a, it just assumes that a deal is going to get done at some level. Well, that's, that's not necessarily the case. A willing buyer and willing seller. The seller is going to sell if the price is right and the buyer is going to buy if the price is right. And it, and the difference with fair market value is that it's assuming that all parties are rational. And I can assure you that <clears throat> both buyers and sellers uh, oftentimes behave irrationally toward an investment. I mean, they're, they're both big and emotions are, are certainly through throughout the, the process and it, it does differ. So you have to keep in mind when we're talking Fair market value versus market value. Uh, one's one's assuming rational, the other is you know can't necessarily take that same assumption. No compulsion. When I say no compulsion, 
when we're when we're talking about that, the business owner is, you know, may have health problems, may have um, uh, debt challenges, may have a whole host of other things that's prompting the sale, and that is compulsing them to to have to enter the market. In fair market value, it doesn't. Reasonable knowledge, same thing. When we're talking about reasonable knowledge. You know the buy, and that's part of the challenge of selling a company is because the buyer sitting here saying, "My gosh, I, how am I supposed to possibly know how everything that's that's tied up in that business owner's melon? How am I supposed to do that?" And you'll see that a lot of a lot of the challenges in selling a company is those companies that are <clears throat> that the business. You, well, you hear the term that the owner is the business. That's that right there is the problem. Is because if some if not all that knowledge is imparted to the buyer, you know that investment is at risk. Next is the the willing and able to trade. You know, are you, you know, can can you sell the business? I mean, um, and when when I say that, you know, what is preventing the sale? You know, do you have partners? Do you have uh, lien holders? Do you have other interested parties that prevent the sale in high, in fair market value world, it doesn't matter. It just assumes that that just goes away. And then lastly, is there a market? Um, you know that there's a market for for the property. And and as we've seen in COVID, I mean there are there have been some some times where that's just no longer the case, where there's a market for that particular business. So let's move on. So the best price. Um, when we talk about the best price. The only one that can figure out what is the best price is the seller. The seller determines that. And the reason is because they, and, and we, we've seen a number of situations where the high, we, and we always say this, that the highest price may not necessarily be the best buyer. And we've seen a number of occasions where, where we've, we've gotten offers that are higher than, than expected and yet the business owner will select uh, a, an offer that's less that's the better buyer. So we always say that in the event that um, that they're, <clears throat> you know, it, and we see this a lot when 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 business owners come to us um, and they they have a buyer. We always say that you know if you're negotiating with one buyer, you don't you really don't know whether or not that buyer is paying market value. Now, you know, we do, we do, a, like I said, a lot of value work and um, from a sales standpoint, and we, you know, we can, we can piece together, you know, this is how someone should behave based on the, based on the investment opportunity. But until you take it to the market, you really don't know. And, and that's what point number three is, is the seller can never know without a doubt that, and that they've re received the highest price ever. And, and I, I'm a, I'm the exit planning um, after president, and one of the stats there, not, they say 75% of business owners regret selling, and a lot has to do with the regret of not knowing whether or not they achieved the 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 highest price, and and working through a process, at least you get closer to that. Okay, so moving on. Maybe. So who are the buyers? And and let me preface this, but why am I talking about buyers? Well, because we're, you know, we're the the whole premise of this is to talk about value. Well, depending on on who the buyer is for your business, that's how they're gonna look at value. So so I, I talk I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these particular types of buyers and how and why they would buy a particular business and you'll soon see that value differs so first one well let me let me go over the 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 types of buyers so you got financial buyers you got synergistic you got private equity groups and then you have the bottom feeders i, I won't talk about bottom feeders because i think everybody knows who they are um you know they're just fishing for a deal and um, they're not really interested in paying market value they're just they're just preying on uh on uh, uh, business, uninformed business owners. But the good news is that you're here on our webinar and you, by the time we're done, you will not be victim to the bottom feeders. So let's talk about the, 
financial buyers. So these are people that are that are motivated by returns on their investment. They may be in the in the business and we heard last week or last month when we talked about uh, or earlier this month when we talked to John Randall uh, from Live Oak Bank, one of the things that we were talking about is is the resume of the buyer. So so from a financing standpoint, that buyer typically comes with some level of expertise that they can transfer on to that particular business. Again, I talked about it last time, you know, that this these types of buyers are looking for that business to pay for the investment and, and like any investment it, that's what it should do but it should be able to pay somebody's salary or pay somebody to run it it should provide you know be able to service the debt and it should be able to get a return of and of it and on the investment so again these are you know these are the 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 typical businesses that um that uh, fall under financial buyers. Again, they're they're predominantly looking for a job. They're using, you know, conventional and SBA financing. And like I said, they're they're interested in how much can I pay myself? Can I service the debt? And can I get a return of and on my investment? The next type of buyer <clears throat> that we talked about was synergistic buyers, and those are dumped into two different categories. The first bucket is their direct and indirect competitors. So, so why why are they synergistic? Now, and and let me preface this, and it, and if you are a business owner that is um, thinking that you know perhaps my competitor is my is my ideal buyer, that may be the case, but you really need to tread lightly in in that approach. And the reason I sh I say that is because you know. We often, you know, in our practice, confidentiality is 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 the cornerstone of our practice. It it just is, and we we go to extreme lengths to ensure that we preserve it. And so when and when a business a competitor learns that that Joe is for sale, now even though you know we may be good buds and and so on and so forth, we're still competitors. You, you know, do you really think that they're, they're, they're not going to say, yeah, Joe's going out of business. You know, you, know, you may be, you may need to start thinking about who's going to do your work since Joe's retiring or, you know, it's not that, that Joe is formulating his exit plan. It's not any of those reasons that, that may, that would make sense to anybody that, you know, in the event that I, I don't sell my business, you're still going to get the same level of, of service that you always have. Instead, it is a it's it's a real risky um, undertaking to approach that that competitor, and that's why we always you know we serve as that buffer. We're you know we're 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 looking at all kinds of buyers, not only the high the the individual buyers, but the, these strategic buyers. I'm just doing my job. I'm not telling you who it is, but if you're looking at growing through acquisition, we may be the the group that can that can help you find that business. So again, to, to wrap up the, the direct and indirect competitors, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at, you know, one plus one equals three mentality. What can I, what can I combine in order to make the, the deal optimized, whether that be in location, whether that be in cost savings, whether that be in, in staff. Um, you know, I think, you see a lot of industries under consolidation. This is what they they do. Now the question the question then becomes, well, am I going to get a premium? Well, the 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 long answer to the short question is typically yes. Um, and what and the, I know the follow up question is, well, what is that premium? Well, we we often see a bump of between you know twenty to 30, 40 percent. But the problem we bump into is a lot of businesses, you know, they, the only buyer is probably the, the, the competitor or strategic buyer. All right. So moving on to the, the, the next bucket, which is these cross-selling buyers. And, and that's, from that standpoint, we're, we're looking at somebody that has a complimentary product or service. Like for example, an accounting firm has you know one that focuses on tax. It makes sense for them to perhaps pick up a a, a company that has 
that has a, a focus in audit or or uh, quality of earnings reviews or things like that. Same thing with um, uh, let's see another good one. Uh, lawn care businesses, you know, those that are that are that have the um, you know, mowing and, and topical treatment, well, they may be a great candidate for a uh, landscape company. So but they're, they're serving the same group. And again, it, it, the tough part is until you know who they are, you don't know what the, what the uh, financial bump may be as a result of it. So, um, so with, as we look at these synergistic type buyers, you just have to keep in mind um, you really don't know what the premium is until you know who you're dealing with. The next one is uh, private equity groups. Um, most of the people on this call probably are not candidates for private equity. Um, private equity, that, I mean, they're professional buyers that are looking for well-run businesses that have great margins that are looking to I say optimize, they are going to bring their entire professional uh, organization to that business and they are going to retool it and they are going to make it make it hum. And with the intent that either it's going to be added uh, based for a platform where they're going to go around and buy other companies like yours, or it's going to be an add on to something they already have. But regardless, they're they're professional buyers and they're going to make your business um, a not an owner operated kind of thing this is an investment that's producing income that is produce that is going to to uh, 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 pay their their respective stakeholders and so uh, most of the most of the people in our in our world you know I'd say a, a small percentage do qualify for for private equity Um I, I shouldn't say a problem. I'll, probably, I'll bet you 20% of our practice is, are candidates for for private equity. And and again, it just it just depends. It depends on on the type of business on who's going to to buy it. But as they look at value, they are looking at at how this business can grow and for a fractional interest holder where they'll buy a fractional interest most of the time a a majority stake. And then they and then they grow it accordingly. So that's private equity. All right, approaches to value. There's, I, I want to stress this because you you see all the to the left, we we have all of these different levels of value: net income, free cash flow, EBIT, EBITDA, normalized cash flow, EBITDA plus officers comp, adjusted EBITDA, and seller's discretionary cash flow. The reason I share that with you is because I'm often faced with explaining. You know, a, a business owner will have uh, a multiple in their head, but the problem isn't the multiple. The problem is what they're multiplying it against. And as you can see to the left, there's various different um, uh, earnings that apply to it. So I, 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 the reason I created this slide was so that you would see that that there all these numbers can be right. It just depends on what your what your multiple is, and are you applying the multiple correctly? So the approaches to value, asset income market, those are the three approaches like any other asset. So when we look at the asset approach, it's often not used because it's just assemblage of the assets. In in our world, it's you know we're looking for for businesses that that are ongoing that we can. Um, you know, that there's some goodwill associated with it. You know, if the, if it's just uh, an assemblage of assets and there's no goodwill, chances are it's going to go, uh, it's probably better served um, in a liquidation kind of ca capacity. So now the next we have the, the value is typically an orderly liquidation. Forgive me, there is a squirrel that apparently has uh, infiltrated my, my yard so we have a orderly trans uh orderly liquidation of the ongoing business all right and it's often used for businesses that have um that are looking for additional capacity and it's typically the, the lowest value next is the income approach the reason i share the income approach and i want i want you to to 
to understand that this is a this is predominantly for buyers. So the buyers, and the reason I say that is, um, the reason I, I say that on the the buyers is because the buyers have their own risk tolerance. Like for example, if you wanted to buy my my the the business brokerage, it's a substantially more risky for you to buy because you never ran a business brokerage. For me, it's no big deal. I've been doing it 30 years. So so my things. So as we look through through this through the through the approach, these various levels of, of value, we have our discounted future earnings, and and that's based on forecast. All right. So as a buyer, you have <clears throat> you look at your your what do you believe that the business is going to do? Okay. You need to understand that sellers when they go to market and this is you you need to be sensitive to this that when you if you start talking about the potential of the 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 business the the business the business buyer you know that your projection may be entirely different um and then and and as well as uh, more risk you know you look at, at growing the business and it's not that big of a deal For them it's an entirely different different standpoint so then we move into capitalization of earnings and the capitalization of earnings is 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 typically mismatched so when we look at look at it it is a, a um it is typically a matter of um uh, of a stable earning stream all right whereas most business don't have a stable earning stream it's there there's some volatility there so that often is not a, 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 an approach that we use and then capitalization of excess earnings um duration the um the uh, uh, tangible and intangible assets now where we spend all of our time is the market approach so the so when i when i'm looking at this the I'm looking at various databases, and this is more of a um, this is more of a situation where we have um, think of the thing of as as your house, all right? You're you're buying a a house, and when you get a real estate appraisal, you have you know these are the various different metrics on the houses that are that are being sold. You have the um, the different um, um, you know, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, size of the yard, things like that. I'm doing the same thing, but I'm using businesses. What is the size of the business? Where is the business? What's the the uh, earnings to revenue ratios? What? How long has the business been in business? Um, how many employees? Again, geography. And I'm a and I'm compiling all of that in order to get a a singular <clears throat> or a, a sample size of here's how a buyer should behave toward this investment all right and so and and so now let's look at how your business was affected by covid the the first thing is business value is made up of these three components one expected cash flow two growth of that cash flow and three what's the risk associated with achieving the cash flow based on those forecasts so let's look at how it approaches to the asset approach or how it affects the three approaches to value first on the asset approach the first thing is that there's a lot of supply and you know it, it's based on supply and demand of equipment and right now there's a there's a glut of of, of equipment on the you know on out and available so it's suppressing the value of equipment and again based on you know a, a lot of well I, I don't know i don't want to quote misquote statistics but a number of businesses you know have not necessarily shut uh, closed down but they idled their 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 particular businesses and as a result you know there's a lot of idled equipment now the last part that i want to share is the capital expenditures so we talk to a lot of business owners and you know when when they sell the business before they start the process of selling their business and so they don't make they don't they don't uh, they don't have the they don't spend any money on the business all right so they just keep on pulling pulling um 
um, you know, they just keep pulling money from the business rather than reinvesting. And the reason I share this with you is I want you to understand that that the buyer is going to penalize you for that. You know, if if you're, it's one thing if it's it's in good working order. That's that that's one thing. That's fair market value, no big deal. If, however, you know, there are a number of things that you have to be done to the equipment to bring it into uh, its optimal stage or its optimal uh, uh, working order. I'm telling you, every every buyer is, is going to penalize you for that. Okay, the income approach. So so now we're talking about internal and external risks. And the reason I share this is because internally, COVID helped everyone see the chinks in their armor. All right. And when I say the chinks in the armor, we're talking about, you know, who and how the business runs. A lot of businesses now uh, realize that they can run more efficient, efficiently as the external risks, however, we're talking about another different challenge, which is, you know, what, and, and especially now. So we have a new president. So how's that going to affect us? We have, we'll probably have new regulations based on COVID. You know, how does that affect it? If you're in the hospitality industry, you have a, an entirely different perhaps um, way of, of operating your, your food and beverage business. I mean, and so, so who and what can, uh, from an external standpoint, affect affect you. So, so the income approach again. It's and by the way, this is this is aside from how the seller looks or how the seller or the seller's appraiser looks at the business. It is an entirely different animal where <clears throat> the buyer, from the buyer standpoint. So, as those buyers perceive these risks, they they're going to change it. Now. The market approach, like I said, I spend most of my life in here, uh, and I talked about this before. But you know, you have the number of sales. Uh, this is across the nation, by the way. The number of sales decreased by 22 percent, but the value increased by 12 percent. Which, which here, the reason why is the cheap cost of capital. So the cheap cost because of the capital. Um, um, and when I say that, you if you'll remember, they the SBA had basically six months free cash for businesses that sold, I think, before September 21. Now, now granted, they were they're doing the same thing now. All right. So so from now until September, they're going to be offering that same six months free um free cash. So so that contributed to it as well as you know there was higher unemployment and people were, were were having to be more competitive for the deals so next so what can you do uh one buyers confused buyers don't buy and so so you your earnings clear and when i say that is is you on your income statement, you have to be able to point to all of the direct and indirect compensation that you as the business owner get. The next thing is you need to get that PPP off your income statement, all right? Because either, it, it, I was I was talking to a, a, a business uh, owner, or I was reviewing their, her financial statements and, and from the surface, it looked profitable, but you know, she had embedded all of the, uh, PPP income that she received, and obviously it inflated it. Now, look, everybody understands, and that that 2020 was really an anomaly, and well, at least we hope it is that it's an anomaly. And and both, um, you know, you may or you may not pick up some lift from that. But from a buyer standpoint, if I'm the buyer, I'm sitting here saying, yeah, I'm not really certain. You know, maybe we should wait and see how you do in 21. If I'm the seller, I'm saying, you know, I survived. I should get a premium. Well, you don't, you you don't know, and you can't quantify that. So my point to you is that when you when you look at this particular, as you look at this uh, 2020 from an appraisal standpoint, taking it, <clears throat> if you had a, a big bump, I'm not saying that you know this is what's going forward. If um and and conversely, if it went south, I'm not saying that that's the, that the business is worth less. From a deal 
standpoint, we're looking at, all right, how do we, how do we mitigate the risk from the buyer that, that the business may not come back while at the same time we're maximizing the, the value for the seller. Um, and so it just depends. And there's various, you know, we can talk all day about different vehicles that, um, uh, to achieve that. But most, most common are self-canceling notes or earnouts. Um, you know, but, the, but again, those are, those are just a couple of things that, that we do in order to, to make that work. Let me see. I think I've got, um, I thought I had some questions. Okay. Next are my questions. So I was asked <laughs> what multiple sh should I expect? Uh, it, it depends on your business. Um, you know, it, Literally, it, it depends on the business. Now, from from my standpoint, what we do when we look at market multiples, we here here is the sample size of the business that we, you know, of the deals that have been done. I look at what the what the median is. What is the middle? And, and then I compare your business against that particular business and say, all right, is is it uh, uh, superior or inferior to to it? And um, and that's what, that's how I, that's how I look at the market multiples. You should never, you should never take, um, yeah, an average and just assume that it is, it is the, the multiple. Now I can tell you from, and this is going to kill you, but you know, your, your multiples typically run, you know, one to five times adjusted cash flow. So, uh, where you fit, I, I don't know if you, you want to, circle back and give me some more information. I might be able to help you out with that. Uh, the next question is what, what percentage uh, does IBA take out of the sale? Uh, do you have a minimum value to sell? All right. So let's just assume it's, it's main street. Our typical fee is 10% of the first million, 5% thereafter. Um, do we have a, a minimum value to sell? Not necessarily. I mean, uh, I, we, I mean, we've sold things as small as fifty thousand dollars, and we've sold things, you know, up in the twenty twenty five million dollars. And so, no, I, I mean, I'll let you know if it's if it's too 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 small for us to sell, and then we'll we'll see if we can't help you out where you can, uh, you know, where you can get it sold. All right, how to account for COVID's impact on the true pre pre COVID value of the business? I think we we touched on that. Um, COVID affected all of us and and the lenders and the underwriters and all the people out there recognize that. And as I said, we, it it's not somebody, it, somebody is just not going to say, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm going to stroke you a check and, and not think about COVID. Somebody's going to have, any professional advisor that's advising the buyer is going to sit there and, and, and want to make sure that, that, Business is going to is going to return, and they're going to structure it in a, in a manner that uh, that reflects that. All right. Next, how do I qualify? How do I find qualified buyers for my business? Um, well, you know, self-serving. You hire a professional business brokerage to do that for you because we roughly go through. I think it's. I think our stat was twenty-three buyers to get one qualified one. Not, and I, when I say qualified, I mean qualified that is going to be coming down to um, uh, to make an offer. From our standpoint, when you know we get we get so many so many people that are interested in 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 buying a business, the problem isn't necessarily financial. The problem is, you know, do they know what it what is expected in being a business owner? You know, the risk associated with being being that business owner where you're the last person to get paid, we talk more people out of business than into business. And so, so from a qualification standpoint, financial is, 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 uh, that's the easy one. It's, you know, are you really suited for business ownership? And, you know, the good news is that, you know, Google has helped a folks like us, you know, help buyers. Buyers are coming in more informed. So I, you know, as I said, I think we're 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 probably seeing more um, business buyers um, that are qualified on the inbound. I can tell you, we we 
we go we go through a lot of them to before that particular one you know buys that particular business all right uh, i've heard conflicting information regarding accounts receivable not being accounted for in the acquisition thoughts on requiring this well it depends on the type of business as i said you know pretty much everything is um everything is on the table to, to be negotiated i think the challenge that you have um with the accounts receivable is you need to understand if you're if you're going to get the accounts receivable you probably should get the accounts payable too we and you know it it just that's how that's how it's accounted for so sometimes it's the asset value plus net working capital other times it is not but how do you account for the accounts receivable is sometimes the buyer will collect and remit it back to the seller post closing we have um some will buy it, some the seller will collect it themselves. Uh, it just depends on, on the business, but it, it's always accounted for. And, and, and which brings me to my next point is, um, let me see, I've got a question. Um, okay, since 2020 was an anomaly, is an earnout responsible to, con to consider? I, I think an earnout, anytime there is, um anytime that the buyer is or the seller is expecting a premium or just ex expecting fair market or market value going forward i think that that's a that is a reasonable uh, tool to to accomplish its intent which is to minimize the exposure for the buyer but at the same time maximize the value for the seller thanks for that question. So swinging back over to the accounts receivable, um, we, again, when, when you sell a business, you, like I said, you get the from there as a seller, you then liquidate your balance sheet. So you get your cash, you get your accounts receivable and any other, any other uh, current assets. And at the same time, you're now also responsible for, for all of the, the uh, current and long-term debt. So that that's how it's typically handled. Okay, any more questions? All right, let me. So next one, um, we get this question a lot. What's it like to to work with a business broker? And so we're going to tell you. So next next uh, uh, Thursday, March twenty fifth at eleven a.m., we're going to talk about um, about working. With a broker. Um, before you go, I do have one last question. Um, will I be available for a phone call after the webinar? I am available for a phone call. My, you have my uh, telephone number right there, 317-218-8616. I'd be happy to do that. Next question, uh, how do you value IP? Well, it depends what the IP is. And IP, for those of you who don't know, is intellectual property. So, so, for example, if you have a um, uh, if you have special knowledge, all right, that um, is that's a let me give let me think about a good example. So, uh, intellectual property like franchises, franchises have a have some level of intellectual property. Can you carve it out? Uh, probably not, because you have to have a a matter you have to have um, an earning stream to to affix to it. So it doesn't. It, it, if you have intellectual property or IP, you have to. It has to be able to generate earnings. Now, can you separate the IP from the business? Yeah, there's people that specialize uh, specialize in it. Again, it's based on on dis, on um, on projections and such. But yeah, and, and I know I'm I'm being vague, but the 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 span of intellectual property is is wide i'm trying to think we had um like for example there was a company that had a a, a number of recipes and and i know it's 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 food but they they were they you know they, they had lots of cut not lots of customers but they had lots of people that were using these recipes so what's the business worth without the recipes well the business is worth nothing without the recipes so so in that case the 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 
business value and the IP value were synonymous. So hope hope that clears you up. If if you need a contact for for uh, specialized in IP, just let me know. All right, next question: How much prior to wanting to sell should you start the process? Um, well, as as an exit planner, you know you you need you know you need three years. Uh, as as a as a deal guy, I think it's probably in everybody's best interest to um, you, you at least know on what you're getting into. Now, we always say you know you need to understand your value, and you if you have the runway and you can go back and work on your business, yeah, you know, then have at it. That you know, we're happy to do that. In fact, we I, we just recently added value growth services where 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 we'll come alongside you, coach you on how to to grow your value when you're ready, then we'll take it to market. But but the sooner that you can understand <clears throat> what you have rather than than find out uh, down the road um, is is most is is would would benefit you. And that's why that's why we got in that's why we do so many valuations is because people want to know um you know people want to know what the value of their companies are. And we want them to know well before we get into the into the market because, you know, you, you, what's the analogy um, from Mike Tyson? You know, uh, everybody has a, you know, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Well, we don't want you to get punched in the face. So anyway, that's um, the sooner the better. All right, uh, issued patents in particular. Um, so Mike, on that one, I am, that's above my pay grade. I, I would probably refer you out to, to some of the IP folks uh, that, that we work with. So if you, if you need a referral on that, uh, uh, drop me a note and I'll be happy to, to, uh, to get that for you. All right, next question. Um, is inventory included or excluded when paying a multiple of cash flow for the business? Um, normal inventory tends to go with the, with the multiple. Um, at the same time, I've seen it both ways, and I, I always say it's business plus value, or it, um, business plus inventory because it just it just keeps it cleaner. Now, however, if if there, but that's good inventory. Just because you have a million dollars of inventory, of which you know two hundred thousand is any good, that does not mean that that the buyer is going to buy that. If you have slow moving inventory, there's all kinds of other things that you have to consider. But from from a from a market data standpoint and, and multiples, I've seen it both ways. Most of them include normal inventory. It just depends. I mean, you have to do a little research into what that multiple was consisted of. But from a from a practitioner standpoint, I, I say keep it out and keep it separate. All right. Um, Will you help negotiate a deal with my family or employee? Yeah, we always, we, we, in fact, we, it, it's funny you, you mentioned that because we, we often are um, asked to do, to do that, that, you know, let's take our first, here, here's a key employee. We want to take a, a, uh, uh, you know, give that person that opportunity to, to buy the business. If, if they can, great. If not, at least I tried to get them in the driver's seat. So yeah, we, we we typically will coach them, um, you know, through the process, and then si at simultaneously, then we'll we'll take it to market. So yeah, that's a great question. And then Mary, um, how much do you charge to do a business evaluation? Well, it's unlike it, it's hard to to say, and and it, when I say it's hard to say, it depends on the business because the the quality of the data that I get, we 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 scope we scope the work. First, so as a rough rule of thumb, you can anticipate anywhere from a thousand to three thousand dollars is probably the average. You know, when and as well as what is what is expected. You know, from a deliverable standpoint, what we do that's a, a, a considerably different than than the most is I just don't I don't want to give you a report. No one reads my reports. Um, it, the, it which is kills me from a from an authoring standpoint, but no one reads them. So what we do is we in anymore we we do it on Zoom or we'll, when the the time comes we'll bring them back to the office. But I I I still give a report, but I want to go through. I want you to understand what the value is. I don't want you to read it. I want you to ask your questions. I want you to 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 understand 
the same process I went through and why I made the decisions I went through. And what we found is most business owners really appreciate <clears throat> going through that process more so than the than the uh, than the report that becomes a, a a coaster or never to be looked at again. Hmm. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Um, as I said, next webinar, Thursday, March 25th, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. One last call on questions. All right. Going, going, and gone. Thank you so much for your time, and I look very forward to, to seeing you next month.